Let's go to our next section that, again, has a great confusion. There's been victory, and, and the response is grief and, and fear among the people. Now we see the people are coming more into the forefront. We, we see here chapter 19, verse 8. Notice it's, it's cut in half with, 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 with your heading, most likely. And all the people came before the king. Okay, so, so, so the people with David are coming to him because they finally came out in victory. But, but notice the second half of verse 8. Now all Israel had fled, every man to his own home. Well, we, we, we knew they fled because at the end of the, the battle, verse 17, and all Israel had fled to his own home. There, there's Judah, that's the tribe of David, that's where Jerusalem is. Then there's the other tribes, the ten northern tribes. They've been fighting with Absalom, and they've fled. They're going home. And this conversation is important. Actually, it's not a conversation. It's, it's an argument. And all the people were arguing through all the tribes of Israel. The king delivered us from the hand of our enemies and saved us from the hand of the Philistines. Okay, that's David. King David, he is the one who gave us peace from all our enemies. But, but now he has fled out of the land from Absalom. Okay, so, so David abandoned the throne. He, he put the people under Absalom by abandoning the throne. But Absalom, whom we anointed over us, is dead in battle. Okay, so, so you, you capture their predicament. There was David, he was great. He fled then there was Absalom. We aligned ourselves with Absalom, but now he's dead. We can't put him on the throne. What, what are we to do? What are we to, what, who, who are we going to elect next? What's the next best option? That last verse is important. Now, therefore, why do you say nothing about bringing the king back? This next section is all about Jesus coming, or uh, Jesus, David coming back. Okay, he's fled, he's out of the promised land, he's not even in Israel, he's not in Jerusalem where he should be, he needs to be brought back. And here, the first thing we see is an argument, this is our problem, now, why aren't we talking about bringing him back? And notice all they're doing is talking about bringing him back. They're not inviting him back, they're not making plans to bring him back, they're talking about bringing him back. Okay? So, so, so we see there, there's, there's going to be a, a coming back emphasis. Now here, 11 to 15. David has to initiate with his own tribe to request coming back. And that's weird. A king asking, now can I come back? And King David sent his message to Zadok and Abiathar, the priest, Say to the elders of Ju Judah, why should you be the last to bring the king back to his house when the word of all Israel has come to the king? You are my brothers. We're bone and flesh. Why then should you be the last to bring back the king? He's appealed to the elders. We're flesh and blood. We're the same tribe. You, you don't want to be the last. You want to be the first. Verse 13, and say to Amasa, are you not my bone and my flesh? Amasa is the general, was the general for Absalom. David, Joab, Absalom, Amasa. Amasa is David's nephew, just like Joab. So, so he's appealing to Judah. Amasa is from the tribe of Judah. Are you not my bone and my flesh as well? God do so to me and more also if you are not commander of my army from now on. In place of Joab. Okay, remember that. Two cousins. Amasa, the enemy general, just replaced Joab, the one who killed David's son. And he swayed the hearts of all the men of Judah as one man. So they sent word to the king, return, come back, both you and all your servants. So the king came back to the Jordan, and Judah came to Gilgal to meet the king and to bring the king over the Jordan. So there's been a great parade. People are coming back down to, to bring the king in. 
and we're going to go through this next section pretty quickly, but you, you notice there verse 19, Shimei. Verse 24, Mephibosheth. Verse 31, Barzillai. Well, those are three characters we had on the way out of Jerusalem. Shimei is uh, from the tribe of Benjamin. He was the one cursing David. And David said, no, the Lord will bless me if I just endure this curse. The Lord has had him set up to curse me. And, and in a very similar conversation, one of his mighty men say, just, just let me kill him. Let me cut his head off. David again, he, he hears that again and says, no. Now what's interesting about Shimei, he, he comes and he, he says, let not, verse 19, let not my Lord hold me guilty or remember how your servant did wrong in the day my Lord the king left Jerusalem. Do not let the king take it to heart for your servant knows that I have sinned. giving a full confession. David says, today you will not die. Complicated, whenever David hands the throne over to Solomon, he gives instruction to kill him. Verse 24, Mephibosheth comes, and he explains to David, no, Ziba, he, he tricked me. All this was a, a farce. And, and so David, he does give Ziba some of the land, and, and, and Mephibosheth more, but Mephibosheth, he, he seems to be the son who finally gets it. He's He's, a, he's actually a grandson of Saul, but he's been brought to the king's table to be treated like a son. Mephibosheth doesn't care about the land. He just is glad David's home. He, he seems to be the one who actually gets it. David is the anointed who's shown loving kindness. He just wants him home. Now, Barzillai, the, the Gileadite, he's the one who blessed David with food and provisions and, and proper care, and, and he's too old to come, so he sends his son and so David comes back, restored in some way to Shimei and Mephibosheth and, and, and giving honor to Bar Barzillai. But our attention needs to drop down on verse 41. Notice again, the people are in view. All the men of Israel. There's three different statements Remember, all the Israel, they're fleeing, and they're arguing, why are we not talking about bringing David back? David asked Judah, you don't want to be the last people to bring me back. And now we see friction. The men of Israel, that is the ten tribes, came to the king. The men of Israel, they come to David, and they say, why have our brothers, the men of Judah, stolen you away? Remember, Absalom had stolen their hearts? Now, now, now they're, they're saying, David, why have you let your tribe, Judah, steal you away from us? And they brought the king in his household and all David's men with him. Israel is, is, is asking, David, why are you letting Judah steal you away? Now, that is important if we think, if David's pattern has been to show partiality and favoritism. You're afraid of him not looking at you and showing you favoritism. That's what's driving this. Israel's saying, why would you let them steal you away? There, there's fear if a king shows partiality. Verse 42, the men of Judah answer back to Israel. Because the king is our close relative, he's blood in our bone. Why then are you angry over this matter? We have not eaten at all the king's expense, or has he given us any gift? We haven't been bribed. We, we're just doing what's right among, uh, according to the family. So Judah responds to Israel. Now Israel responds to Judah. Notice it's focused here. We have ten shares in the king. And in David also, we have more than you. Why then do you despise us? Were we not the first to speak of bringing David back? And, and yes, they were the first to speak of bringing David back. Th these three statements are, are just highlighting whatever commotion and argument is going on among the, the tribes. And it's all about making sure that we, we get some kind of share because if you don't have an absolute share, if you don't have favoritism from this king, you might not get anything. David has proven himself to be an untrustworthy king. 
Notice how our author, our narrator, gives us an interpretation. The words of the men of Judah were fiercer than the words of Israel. Three different speeches, but what we see here are cracks. These cracks are going to lead to a rebellion, next chapter. These cracks are going to lead to division. These cracks are going to actually eventually, in two generations later, lead to these two peoples, these two sections, dividing. Northern Israel, southern Israel, after Solomon, his, his, his sons divide the kingdom. And we see here David's own sin, David's inability to lead, David's inability to be just is what starts putting those cracks in. They're going to eat away into division. He has shown partiality, and so his people jockey for position. It's, 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 it's what they would naturally do because they don't trust him. And so you see tribes divided. Here's where we ask, what kind of rule does God have for us? What kind of rule is good for us? One key question we should be asking, what kind of king can keep sinners united? Well, the answer is the only one that can keep us united is the only one who can save us. You know, we, we think about divisions and rivalries in churches and nations and peoples. What, what's the strategy? What's the resolution? Well, for us, we need to see that Jesus came to actually heal these very kinds of divisions. He came to take those who felt estranged, who were estranged, those who were far off, to bring them there. He is the one who takes away the dividing walls and brings about a new kind of people from all tribes, all peoples, all nations. He seeks to bring in all who come to him by faith. Here's here's the good news. Jesus does not show partiality. He's the only one of us that doesn't. But Jesus does not show partiality. Jew, Gentile, male, free, slave, free, male, female, slave, free, barbarian, and and Scythian. Now we think about that. He doesn't show partiality. The first thing we have to realize that means is he will give everybody what they deserve. If we demand to get what we deserve, Jesus will show no partiality. He will see every deed and he will treat it as it deserves to be treated and there will be judgment and wrath. He does not show partiality. David does. He did not punish the wicked. He would not discipline his children. Jesus does not show partiality. He renders unto us according to our works. Unless we come to him by faith. And there again, there is no partiality no matter who you are in your background, no matter who you are in in your nationality, your gender, your your people group, your sin. If you come to him by faith, there's no partiality. He says, you're forgiven. The challenge here is what kind of king is David? He's a, a failing king because he is not a trustworthy king. What kind of king is Jesus? He is the great king because he is perfectly trustworthy in every way, and he is always good. We see Israel fighting and dividing and sinning because of their trying to work out and underneath their own king. Church, are we going to be better than Israel? Our king is better. Are we going to be better than Israel? Are we going to try to jockey for position? Are we going to lead to cracks and divisions? Are we going to see him as good and powerful? And therefore, I want to promote his goodness. Are we going to see how generous he is as the kind king? Or do we think he's stingy and so we hold on? 
Do we see that he gives in wisdom and so we know that whatever he gives is good for us in whatever situation we're in and, and the, what he gives to others is good for them? David is not a good king here. His sins are coming and they're now affecting all the people. We have a better king. Are we going to be a better people? 